Welcome everyone. So pleased to see you all here at the grand finale of the very first year of the Hornbill Awards. This award was established by Climate Governance Malaysia to support biodiversity conservation in our country, which is one of only 17 mega biodiverse countries in the world. Climate Governance Malaysia is a volunteer driven network of directors and many others who are advocating for increased awareness of climate risks. We are the country chapter of the World Economic Forum's Climate Governance Initiative. Now, I am especially delighted to introduce our MC for today, the very lovely Megan C from our partner, the regional leading media and business intelligence company dedicated to sustainability eco-business. Over to you, Megan. Thank you, Sunita, for having me here today. It is our honor to be the MC of this exciting and meaningful event. Allow me now with just a few, few moments to set up the scoring system. So each NGO that you just seen earlier in the videos had submitted a detailed project paper, which includes a description of the project impact, how the project is to be executed, and also other project costings as well. These detailed submissions have been evaluated by our judges prior to this event. 50% of the points will go to this detailed submission. Second, a short video has been creatively put together by the NGOs and volunteer student interns. Also already evaluated by the judges, 20% of the points go to the videos. The videos will also be shown later on in the event. Another 20% of the points will go to a Q&A session by the judges that will take place soon as well. And the remaining 10% will be allocated to our audience voting later on. Let me now introduce you to, to, you to our judges for today's event. Dr. Gary Tessera is a consultant technical advisor at Malaysian Green Technology and Climate Change Center. Raj Bahari Bhattacharji is an associate ed editor at the Edge Business Weekly in Malaysia. And Dr. Muhammad Harafin bin Bushro is the managing director at TMB Research. With that, I'm pleased to be introduce introducing to you our NGOs for today. Each one of them will also be going through a Q&A session with the judges. The first one we have is Regional Environmental Awareness of Cameron Highlands or REACH, based in Cameron Highlands, which is a high altitude hilltop location in the state of Pahang in Peninsula, Malaysia. The project, establishment of a biodiversity and educational site. I think we will now be showing the video of the Good day everyone, come in here. Today, you will walk through my hometown with me. This is Cameron Highlands, my hometown which I've always been proud of. How can I not? Look at these clips and shots. But, hold up. I would like to show you guys some things that are masked and hidden. Flash flood, landslide, declining water quality, disappearing of local flora and fauna. So this is where we would like to come in and to work on a solution. REACH stands for Regional Environmental Awareness of Camera Highland. The idea we are proposing is the Biody site. This site used to be an illegally cleared land and was granted to our NGO to carry out reforestation. We started foresting this site from around 2001. Now this site will be our project. Following are the ideas proposed to be focused at this site. First, reforestation nursery. We learned it in a hard way that we need to nurture a plantling after collecting it from the wild before transferring it to a reforestation site. A plantling should be cared for about 6 to 8 months before it can be transferred to the site. And with this nursery, we can focus on the wild piney species trees to be replanted to allow far speaking of the forest. Second, a pond. This will be a water source for the wild mammals as well as migratory birds. We also have a model to build a micro hydro station to generate electricity just for the usage at this site. Third, cloud housing or fog housing. This place is located at a very high altitude thus it's misty for at least 6 to 8 hours a day. So we are looking into harvesting water from the fog and this water will be stored for usage at the site. Materials to be used are wooden poles and black polymer nets. Next, a weather station is to monitor air and water quality. Working close with the weather and meteorological department, when we notice a decline in quality, we will send in a report and we can start investigating what is the causative factors. We are looking into setting up an app which the local farmers can use to predict the weather. 
This will help in the process of going into organic farming as they will be able to control and plan their activities according to the weather forecast. Finally, biodynamic farming. We know that conventional farming has caused a decline in water quality due to excess pesticide usage. This method of farming will be able to restore soil quality and a possible transition from conventional to organic farming in all farms at Cameron Highlands. Upon success of this project, it will be a prototype for restoration projects in the future. Our goal is to reintroduce local biodiversity at the same time ensure we do not lose any local forest and farmers to extinction. This project will be carried out with the help of local people and this site will be always open for local people to come, volunteer and also conduct educational activities. We do not only want to share knowledge with them but we want our local highlanders to have a sense of belongings. My favorite person once told me that he will not care if you do not know. And the more we teach our local people, the more they will fall in love and the more they will care. And not too long from now, we will achieve this. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Koni, I'm Wafi, I am Aisha, we student from UC Team Nisha Durakanu, we are the interns that have pitched to produce this video. And now we have the judges asking, uh, read some questions now. Can you elaborate on your top three achievements to demonstrate your track record? This was not obvious in your submission. All right. Uh, so, um, first of all, I would like to apologize for stating very shortly about our past achievements and records. Our top three achievements will be CSI or community stream investigators, reforestation at Gunung Brinchang, and recycling campaigns and workshops. CSI, we bring local people, especially students, to the streams and conduct tests to check the water quality. The tests are very basic, yet enough to indicate the purity and cleanliness of the water. Reforestation and next, lastly, recycling campaigns. Uh, we have managed to team up with Solid Waste Corporation to efficiently sort out and recycle daily waste in all the schools up here in Cameron Highlands. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sagar. Uh, Gary to Sarah here. Could you please tell us uh, about the sites that will be rehabilitated with seedlings from the planned uh, nursery? And where are those sites located and why are they important? Uh, that, why is it important that they be rehabilitated? Thank you. Okay, uh, so first, Batu Gangan and Gunung Brinchang. Uh, these are highland mountain forest reserve and also water catchment. So uh, Sungai Terla is the largest water catchment and this area includes the forest reserves of uh, area in Cameron Highlands and uh, Batu Gangan and also Ulu Ichat. They form the eastern slope of Gunung Irau in the Titi Wangsa range. It houses the large biodiversity of flora and fauna and these are cloud forests. And as we know, cloud forests are fast disappearing and with only 510 kilometers square left in Peninsular Malaysia. Because of the cloud stripping effect, they capture water that will not fall to the ground as rain. This water feed about 60% of the head rivers of Peninsular Malaysia. So to protect these forests is to protect most important source of water in Peninsular Malaysia. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Me. From me, um, could you please elaborate on the risk factors of your project and uh, tell us how those risks are? All right, uh, I will answer the questions on the risk factors. So. Uh, there are not many risk factors as we uh, can see for this project. The only risk factor that I would say is the weather. Uh, first of all, uh, we are on a very high land. So uh, it is, uh, we receive the most rainfall. So if it's raining, we cannot uh, conduct events. Uh, there has been days where we have uh, groups coming up to conduct reforestation. And due to the bad weather, we were not able to run the event. And second, 
we also have dry seasons so when we have dry seasons we it will be hard for us to look after the reforestation site as we need to be gardeners we need to water the plants so one way where we can tackle this issue is the fork harvester that i've presented in my video before so with the fork harvester we can roughly harvest about 1000 to 2000 liters of water and that is more than enough for us to plant for us to water the plants that we the trees that we have planted in our reforestation site and lastly uh weather is also another risk factor for the fork harvester as uh, as i mentioned we are very high up so uh the wind movement is very fast so uh in the video there is one picture where i've showed that as a failed project so this time we are going to try a new arrangement to slow down the wind movement at the same time we can uh, harvest water from the fork yeah that's all from me thank you Thank you, judges, and also Reach for answering those questions. I'm going to take on the next NGO right now. It's One Stop Borneo, operating in Tawau, Sabah, a state located in Borneo, East Malaysia. The project, protection of the helmet hornbill, a community-based approach. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the Helmeted Hornbill. I am Chavez Chima and I'm the founder of One Stop Borneo Wildlife. One Stop Borneo Wildlife was founded in 2012. Our life call is to be the voice of the voiceless. We are a team of six full-timers and ten part-timers and volunteers. We do this by executing the four E's. Enforcement, catching poachers. Education, educating the mass public. Enrichment of habitat, connecting isolated forest reserve. And economy by developing long-term sustainable tourism programs. Malaysia has 10 species of hornbills and Sabah Borneo has eight species. The Helmeted Hornbill Community Project will try to assist to protect this species and other species of hornbills and wildlife here in Tawau. The helmeted hornbill is one of the most magnificent and Jurassic-like bird to fly on planet Earth. Why are we focusing on helmeted hornbills? What are the problems it is facing? Two big problems. Number one, poaching. Unfortunately, it's being murdered in thousands for its cask, which is known as the red ivory. Secondly, fragmentation of forest. There are too many isolated pockets of the forest as the helmeted hornbills rely on large tracts of forest for its survival. So, how will we help the helmeted hornbill and other species? With the following five ways. Number one, enforcement in helmeted hornbill hotspot. We will put camera trap, acoustic recorder, so we can hear gunshot and do on-ground patrol. Secondly, locate and guard the nest. The helmeted hornbill prefer certain shaped tree cavities to nest in. So we will search them and guard till the baby chick flies out. Thirdly, education. We will do this by engaging stakeholders from plantations, governments, parks and schools. Fourthly, enrichment of habitat. We will reconnect isolated forest reserves by planting 45 species uh, which are hornbill favorite food and specifically 10 species of helmeted hornbill favorite food. How do we know it's their favorite food? We have been tracking helmeted hornbills for two years now and mapping all their favorite trees. And lastly, through conservation tourism, we will develop volunteerism programs for students, for backpackers, tourists, local and foreign alike. We will create bird watching programs and we will use the profits from those programs to sustain the project in the long run. So, why should you support us? We are the only one in the world, the Yesen Dongo, the government of the government. We have a very good relationship with the government. 
Kami bersama para pelajar dan para pelancong akan menanam beribu-ribu pokok arah. Kami akan menjaga habitat burung enggang dengan inisiatif anti pembuahan haram. We will develop a thriving and sustainable conservation tourism model. Thank you for that video. We're now going to the Q&A session. Okay, um, congratulations. Very interesting uh, proposal. Uh, I have a question uh, on the poaches. Uh, can you please uh, elaborate on uh, who are they, where do they originate from, and uh, how does the organization address uh, the demand side of this issue? Thank you. Okay. So it will be difficult to tackle the overseas demand from this stage, but we will try to tackle the local demand. There are four groups of poachers, workers from small plantation holders in the area, and most of them are foreign. They're, uh, and they're usually opportunistic, but from our sur surveillance uh, every night. Secondly, organized local syndicates, uh, they either come illegally, uh, uh, or foreign, sorry, they either, either come illegally from uh, Sabatic Island, Indonesia, which is just nearby, and they partner with locals. Number three, local hunters, especially from small towns like Morotai, and they walk up in the forest reserves. And lastly, uniform personnel, who I wish not to mention at the moment. But there's some newspaper articles you can read about it and you will get the picture. Um, at, at, so at present, there are several ways which we're tackling this uh, demand. Self-patrols, we do it twice a week. We do visit to the reserves regularly and drive around. Uh, whenever we find anything suspicious, we report it to the authorities, the wildlife department, the forestry and so on. And as we can't be there 24-7, we have placed camera traps as well uh, along the roadside and we try to uh, take down the car plate numbers and so on. We have a positive and professional relationship with forestry department, wildlife department, suburb parks, and it has taken us years to do this. Uh, we also help Sime Darby and, uh, sorry, plantations in general and suburb parks. And we work closely with them by informing them any suspicious behavior or giving them camera traps as well. And uh, regular meetups and intelligence sharing with, with all of them. Uh, and that's another thing. And lastly, through education, we do all sorts of education programs in the school areas and we do competitions, workshops, and we do rescues and releases. So the kids can go to the parents and educate them. That's how we do it. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Shima, Gary here. Uh, I have a bit of a two part question. First of all, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the targeted uh, area for your project, the seven kilometers, uh, is actually in areas closer to human settlement and in non-protected areas. Wouldn't it therefore allow easier access for the poachers? That's the first question. And secondly, how would that small area address the uh, whole life cycle and range of the helmeted hornbills, which uh, actually should cover a, a much broader area? Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Firstly, since the inception of this award, we have struck a deal with a few smaller plantations and also a bigger one to expand our tree planting program. And the whole project is more than 10 square kilometers. Secondly, it is only the tree planting program, which is in the non uh, protected area, which uh, and, and not in the state under the state government. But we're also doing uh, other projects like the finding and guarding the nest in the 29,000 hectare Tawau Hills, for example, and helping them with enforcement, education, and tourism. So, and our project specifically includes uh, enhanced monitoring of the corridor of course, as it will attract local interest and from people as you want to. The non-protected area is still protected in some sense as it is owned by private plantations who have gazetted the area to go uh, as a non-go, no-go no area for outsiders. However, this is exactly why we need to step up the programs. We realize the best enforcement is by more visits to the area, either by volunteers, tourists, or team, more night drives and so on. And lastly, that is exactly the point. It's not all, it's not about the small area. We're not trying to rehabilitate this small area so this can support a helmeted hornbill population, which we do hope so in 10, 15 years. But our main goal is to make them fly from one pocket of the forest to the other. The other smaller pockets of forest have food and space for helmeted hornbills, but helmeted hornbills just won't fly over plantations and other species. Thus, our goal is to create a safe highway passage, basically. The helmeted hornbill is actually a critically endangered animal under IUC and red lace. This is why this passage is very important. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Do we have 
Do we have time for the third question? Yes, we do. Hi, Shabesh. Uh, my question is, your manpower plan shows that you're a small NGO doing many good things in your location near Tawau. Please tell us how you would prioritize your projects and will you be overstretched? Thank you for the question. Very, very uh, realistic. Uh, we all have a very good and disciplined schedule on how we do our task and achieve them. For example, let's say Yulinda, uh, she has a target and schedule. Every week she will do mark coating and cuttings of 100 trees, for example. She will do a school workshop and, and so on. And, and Nina will do the tagging and so on. Uh, I also have a very fixed schedule and Chun as well. I do tree, grass cutting and so on these, these days. I do tree planting and so on these days. Chun does the tree tagging also on these so-and-so days and she does the analysis. So we have a very uh, fixed schedule in that sense. So it sounds like a lot of things we're doing, but we actually have a schedule and we can cover all of it. I uh, help the tourism aspect, Chun leads them on the ground and so on. We will just scale them up uh, when if, if we do get this grant and we will hiring more full-timers and coordinating a local volunteer program. And what will we prioritize on to answer your question? Uh, propagation of thousands of ficus, the trees. Number two, planting them. Number three, locating in the nest and guarding them. Number four, cranking up the education workshops with all stakeholders. And lastly, we will bring in international tourists by working with the local tour operators. And the most important thing I can say is we are creating a specialized volunteer uh, program. This will be done through volunteerism and also local power volunteers, which we have identified already and we will tap into it. They will, for example, help us achieve uh, the, 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 the programs as they will, and they will be a regular schedule. This is basically two birds in one stone because they will, the volunteer program will make the projects, the prioritized tasks above more efficient and also education. They will go back to their home, to their families and spread the message. And uh, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Chavez and the judges, for that very insightful Q&A session. Um, now we're going to bring on the third NGO. We've got Bring Back Our Rare Animals, or Bora, an NGO also located in Sabah, East Malaysia. The project, creating feeding grounds for wild elephants. Over the past century, Sumatran rhinos were hardly reproducing. Most were infertile and births were few and far between. Iman, the last Sumatran rhino in Malaysia who died in 2019, was a clear example. Leading up to the extinction of the Sumatran rhino in Malaysia, international wildlife institutions were struggling to get their act together to facilitate a collaborative recovery program. If we hope to reverse the downward trajectory in the numbers of endangered species, we need to put in place measures to ensure that all remaining individuals have the best possible chance of reproducing. In Bora, originally named Borneo Rhino Alliance, we focus on assisted reproductive technology for Sumatran rhinos. In seeing the species go extinct in Malaysia, we learn a few important things. One, Make sure to identify the causes as well as the symptoms. Two, don't wait for international collaboration. If you want something done, do it yourself. Three, start early before it's too late. Bora has since rebranded to bringing back our rare animals. One of our areas of focus is making sure that rare wildlife has enough nutritious food. Human-elephant conflict has happened for thousands of years. One attempt to deal with this in Malaysia was the introduction of electric fencing in the 1930s. But that only partly addressed the problem. Elephants still come out of protected areas. Why? Partly because the places now occupied by humans were once the elephant's domain. And partly because there is lots of lush elephant food outside the protected forest and not so much inside. Elephants are bulk feeders that eat fast-growing plants in large quantities. So why not develop feeding grounds for elephants on deforested land inside protected areas? With government and corporate support, this is what Bora is doing. We focus on growing wild figs, a great favourite of many wildlife species, and are also developing pastures for larger mammals that feed on grass. Now, 
in collaboration with a Malaysian corporation. We are developing an experimental 22-hectare feeding ground for wild elephants on deforested land inside Tabin Wildlife Reserve in Sabah. We estimate that this site could provide enough food for a herd of 60 elephants per month for six times a year. But if we hope to introduce real change, we need to be able to replicate these feeding grounds at other sites and for other species as well. In order to take our work to a larger scale, Bora needs not only funds to sustain our staff, but help in publicizing and providing credibility to this new paradigm of active interventions for endangered wildlife. It's time to address the elephant in the room and shift our focus to wildlife nutrition. But we cannot do this on our own. For this to truly work, we need more than hard dedication alone. Be a part of the solution. Join us in this pioneering approach to wildlife conservation. Thank you for that video. We'll now go on to the Q&A session. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Dr. Payne, Gary Tessera here. Uh, the question is, if you enhanced uh, and localized the food source for the elephants, how would it affect the concentration of the population in, in that area? And secondly, uh, will these plantings affect the natural migratory route uh, of the elephants? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Gary. Hi. I'm going to pass this to Dr. Zainal, if I may, who's our resident elephant specialist. Zainal? Yes, hi. Hi, um, my name is Zainal. I'm uh, a project leader for the, uh, the work in, in, in Tabin. I will answer your, 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 your first question. Well, this project will not affect natural migration routes of any elephants. The current site is on the normal route of at least one herd of about 40 elephants. And they often split into smaller groups, partly because uh, under historical and current conditions, there is rarely enough food for any one place to feed 40 elephants. What we hope is that this new feeding ground will allow more elephants to spend longer time at this particular site. As the site lies inside have been while at reserve. We hope that they will tend to spend more time in the reserve and less going outside into plantations and gardens. Two points to note here. One is that we plan to develop more such feeding grounds inside Tabin Wildlife Reserve, all on deforested sites. So you don't need to worry about loss of forests in this project. And two, over time and through passive learning from mother to calf, these feeding grounds would be imprinted into their knowledge as places not to be missed during their routine migration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, Dr. Alifin here. I have a question. Uh, we, we know that elephants tend to travel uh, in long distances. Uh, may I know, uh, do you track the movement of these animals, uh, for example, like using a collar? And uh, how do you address uh, potential human-elephant conflict that may arise? Thank you. I'm going to well, pass that again to Zainal. This is a, a specialist elephant topic, this. Zainal? Yeah. We do not track movements of the elephants. This has been done by other non-government organizations over the past few years. This project will not add to human-elephant conflict. In fact, I hope it is clear that one of its main intentions is to reduce such conflict. So I want to emphasize a couple of points here. One is that conflicts happen only outside protected areas like Tabin Wildlife Reserve. And two is that human-elephant conflict outside protected areas has been going on for decades, involving smallholders, plantations, and villages. 
conflicts seems never ending because these elephants have now been conditioned to easy food outside the reserve. So by enhancing food supplies in the reserve, the elephants will be reconditioned to spending their time inside and not end up in a conflict. It is also important to understand that this process will take time. We cannot expect a sudden change in the elephant's behavior, but a start has been made. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Hi, this is Nash Bihari. Well, you have identified a list of other partners in your project. Can you elaborate on the role of the top three of them? Okay, I think I better take this one. This is a human one rather than an elephant one. Um, I'd say the Sabah Forestry Department is key because Tabin Wildlife Reserve is legislated as a forest reserve. So the forest department is the manager of the land and the forest. And I'd say this department, Sabah Forestry Department, has, has long been a pioneer of proactive conservation programs in Sabah. And in this area of reforestation, we're a bit worried about planting things other than trees but they're happy with this project. Um, and even if we develop five similar grounds, that would be less than 0.01% of TABIN. So first is forest department. And then the Sabah Wildlife Department is equally key as the department that protects and manages elephants. <clears throat> they have a tough role, as you know, because people tend to blame them when the elephants come out of the protected forests onto private lands. So we hope this project will help the wildlife department to address the human elephant problem. And thirdly, as you probably got from our video, um, are the corporate landowners, particularly the oil palm estates. So these corporations are sometimes blamed for all sorts of issues, but they're, they're just developing lands that were granted by the government. But they have the size and resources and culture to start doing new things quickly. And as you saw in our video, one of the corporations neighboring onto Tabbing Wildlife Reserve stepped up um, to work with Bora on developing this first elephant feeding ground. And I'd say the people in that particular corporation at local Lahadatu level saw that this project has potential and we credit them for seeing that potential and for convincing their bosses to give support. Thank you, John and Dr. Zainal and the judges as well for that Q&A. Um, I'm gonna go on now to the fourth NGO. It's called Kalab Palami located in Mukim of Tanjung, Kupang, Gelang, Pata, Johor, which is the southernmost state in Peninsula, Malaysia. The project, community-led habitat management of the pandas and Pulai River estuaries. Pembangunan sistem air buba kemungkinan itu asal kurang laut jan ribu nelayan di kawasan laut selat terbrau ni boden jenis kecil macam saya tubo satu kaki 19 kaki dia tak boleh tempuh gelombang besar. Dari pada segi laut kita sekarang pun dah semakin kecil. In 2013, Kelab Alami began to focus on ecotourism and research to help our fishermen and community earn more income. People rent our boats to go to the seagrass meadow or nearby Mirabong Island. We design tourism packages ourselves. Our youth are ecotourism guides, the fishermen are boat captains, and local women help to cook meal for the guests. We also have food, market tours, and cooking classes, so that our guests can experience our traditional food and culture. This way, visitors get to enjoy our unique natural environment as well as our culture, history, and habitat. Saya melihat kini remaja kurang menitik beratkan mengenai alam semula jadi. Remaja masa kini perlu tahu mengenai alam semula jadi supaya dapat digunakan untuk masa hadapan. 
Saya berharap ada sebuah program yang dapat menarik semua minat-minat remaja daripada program Alam Semula Jadi. Club Alami runs weekly environmental education classes and workshop to teach our fishermen and village youth about our natural habitats. We hope to train more youth rangers to be habitat monitors, rangers and tour guide. Like us, these youth rangers will be local habitat experts for our seascape from the river to the estuary to the sea. Our fishermen sometimes accidentally catch endangered species as bycatch. We have shovelnose grays, eagle grays, as well as grey bamboo shark. We have taught our fishermen to release these species if they are accidentally caught. The fishermen will report their weight, sex, and location for our research. We want to strengthen our sustainable fisheries program and make sure our fishermen can earn additional income as marine ranchers and continue reporting on our endangered species. We have now a commercial, tourism and education center that we hope will help our community earn money and learn about the environment. We hope to work with the Iskandar Regional Development Authority and our scientist advisor to run a community-led habitat management workshop for the main stakeholder in our area. We will use this venue for all of our activities. We are grateful to the sponsor who helped us to make this possible. We are excited to work together with everyone in our community to help protect our biodiversity and ensure our fishermen have sustainable income and can cope with climate change. Do get in touch to find out how you can help us to achieve our dream. We will make it happen. Thank you for that video, we'll now go on to the Q&A session. Thank you, Gary Kosara here with the first question. Um, your project appears uh, to be very holistic uh, and, and we appreciate the various stakeholder workshops that uh, you've identified in the proposal. Would you be able to tell us more about the biodiversity in the estuaries and what some of the threats might be uh, to uh, this biodiversity? Thank you. Hi, Gary. Thank you very much um, for the question. Um, I'm just going to introduce myself because I'm not on the video. Um, who you saw on the video was Shalan Jumaat, the fisherman that opened up the, the clip, and he's actually our founder. And then you saw a lot of youth, and one of them um, is Irfan, the manager. So he's heading the 10 youth who work for us full time and part time. I am the invisible being behind the scenes who does you know, large present presentations to large audiences in English. I'm their translator, their driver, their ATM. Anything they need me to do, I do. But I'm just the voice, so I'm actually doing what they want me to do. And this is their vision and their views that I am um, putting forward. Okay, so coming back to our biodiversity, we actually have a lot of things in the Tabrao Strait, we call it. Also called the Johor Strait, but I like to stick to the original names. Um, even though there is development on the Singapore side and our side with a port for a city, Sanway Iskandar, Benelec, reclaiming, um, we have a number of endangered species here. We have very unique, healthy habitats of coastal mangroves, seagrass, mudflats, which are um, used by migratory birds, otters, monkeys. We can see them every day. We have an island, which belongs to Malaysia, um, with an intertidal uh, rocky shore, as well as soft coral. Um, we also have endangered species. We have dugongs. We have two species of turtles, the green and the hawksbill. Uh, we have four species of um, seahorses. We have two species of crocodiles, which we try not to meet. Um, and then, you know, there's horseshoe crabs, there's all kinds of other species. The work that we have with our fishermen has been really helpful because it has actually added to our endangered species list. Uh, because they're out there every day and we speak to them every day, we find out new things that are there that many people don't believe is there because of all the development. But it is actually thriving. Thank you, Dr. Serena. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Serena. This is Raj Bihari. Congratulations on your um, work. My question is, your project site is being squeezed by huge development projects on all sites. Are the project owners aware of their impacts to the estuary? And how have they involved themselves in the discussion? 
and how would you encourage more active participation from them? Thank you. Hi, Rash. Thank you for the question. Um, it's a very important question and we're very lucky. We've been running Club Alami since 2008, but a lot of it was under the table, really under the radar with nobody knowing anything and we were just working in the community. But from 2015 onwards, um, with the help of the Iskandar Regional Development Authority who found out about us, um, I can't even remember how, and they introduced us to a lot of the local stakeholders. We didn't dare, to be honest, to approach the businesses and all of this. In 2014, actually, Forest City approached us as they were developing and they had to do a stop work order um, and they had to do stakeholder engagement. And they were actually one of the first developers to say, please continue with what you're doing. We will support you. Um, and so this has been going since 2015 with the help of IRDA, who then introduced us to local agencies, government officers, and the rest of the developers. So we have worked with the port of Tanjung Pulapas. We have walked, worked with um, the Johor Port Authority. If you saw in the video clip, the building, that is actually on land owned by LPJ, the port authority, and given to us to use for free for 15 years, eh, for five years, um, and you know it's renewable. Uh, by the port of Tanjung Pulapas. IRDA has provided us with funding to refurbish it because it was an abandoned factory for 20 years. We have been working with and talking to Sanwe Iskanda. We have contacts in Leisure Farm, in UEM, which is also, also building nearby. And all of these people are very um, interested in being part of the community. And so they are committed to working with us to mitigate the damage that they do. Some of them actually use us to spy on their contractors because, you know, they have people on the ground who are doing work who don't know... Sometimes they don't report everything that they do properly. And so our fishermen and we go down to sea and we see it and we tell the developer and they're like, eh, they send us this different report. So then they check on it. So we've got this good relationship and I've actually mentioned um, this series of workshops with them, uh, to them, and they are keen to participate because then this proves that they are committed to the community. It's very good for their PR as well. Um, so then they would want to work with us to mitigate the damage. Development has to go on. We cannot stop it but we can work together to try and minimize it and provide opportunities for the locals to continue their livelihoods. For us, this is very important. Uh, hi, Dr. Serena. Um, could you please elaborate on uh, how you think the use of the community will participate uh, in, this, uh, in the green economy that may eventuate from this project? Thank you. Hi, Dr. Arifin, thanks for, for the question. The youth are already involved, if you saw in the video, um, they're all over the video. One of them was involved in creating that video with the UMT interns that helped us with it. Um, the kids that were with us as environmental club members from 2008, 10, 10 or so of them are with us now working full-time and part-time. So they've been with the program for more than a decade. For many, it's more than half their lives. Um, and so they are committed because they've seen how valuable this habitat is, these habitats are to the, their community. They've taken a lot of ownership because I've watched them grow over the last 12, 15 years, um, and they are the driving force. So Shalan, who you saw in the video, sets the vision and the objectives. He oversees closely our fishermen's program, but the youth come up with all the smaller objectives. So they come up with the tourism products. They are the ones who come up with the tours. Um, they come up with the, the script. They are the ones who do all the running around because I actually have several full-time jobs. So I just, you know, I help in the background. But these are the guys who are doing the work. They run environmental programs for the community youth. Before COVID hit, they were doing tourism. They were running programs for Iskandar Putri youth. So that's beyond our village boundaries. They were doing a whole lot of things. It's just that everything has gone on hold for about one and a half years because of COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Serena and the judges for- Thank you, Megan. Thanks, everyone. I just want to say uh, we're just two NGOs now, uh, two NGOs left actually. And I love the chat box going on. It's super noisy. It's very dynamic. So please keep your comments coming. Uh, so the next one we have is the Marine Research Foundation, also located in the state of uh, in Borneo, Malaysia. The project mitigating bycatch of endangered and threatened marine megafauna. Sabah, a state located in the east of Malaysia, is a beacon of marine biodiversity. It is renowned for its amazing and bountiful seas which support Malaysia's most well-known fisheries. Dr. Nick Bilger, an adopted Sabahan, pioneered marine conservation in Sabah in 2003. 
Known as the Turtle Doctor, he has always been passionate about sea turtles. Later, his passion extended to dugongs, sharks and rays as his interest in marine conservation grew. Sadly, the very fishing activities that Sabah depends on have accidentally killed thousands of sea turtles, sharks and rays each year. Fishing nets tend to trap everything including non-targeted species which are known as bycatch. Important species such as green turtle and hammerhead shark are not spared from bycatch. Without these species, the marine ecosystem will slowly fall apart. Thanks to Dr. Nick's Marine Research Foundation, we now have proven solutions to the problems. So a TD is nothing more than a metal grid that fits in the neck of a net. And fish and shrimp come through the bars and end up at the back of the net. But something big like an endangered sea turtle comes along and hits the grid and goes out through a flap and safe. TEDs are saving up to 1,000 turtles each year in other parts of Malaysia. Imagine, if the majority of Sabah's troll boats switch to TEDs, we could go from losing 5,000 turtles to saving them every year in Sabah alone. MRF's main goal is to make Sabah fully TED compliant and to work with fishers to ensure their catches are not impacted. These would solve the single largest threat to sea turtles in Sabah. But what about sharks and rays? The story for sharks and rays is a bit more complicated because we don't yet know when and where these species are taken. Without this knowledge, we cannot devise conservation strategies. The bycatch cameras are a little bit of a different story. They sit above the deck and they're taking a photograph every five seconds and anything that ends up on the deck, be it a turtle or a shark or a ray, has its photograph taken for posterity and we know when and where it happened and that data is what allows us to design management solutions. The data for each capture can be used to design management solutions such as time area closures or gear restrictions. These would solve shark and ray by catch nearly overnight. Restricting fishing in areas that are breeding grounds or other important areas for sharks and rays allowing us to restore their populations and ensures continuous survival. Saving turtles, sharks and rays requires ongoing engagement with fishers and government officials through training events, workshops, trials and many more that are acceptable to all. Dr. Nick and his MRF team need the support to continue saving Malaysia's endangered marine species. Over time, the turtle doctor has evolved into the man who saves marine animals for a living. Thank you for the video, and now we're going to go on to the Q&A. Uh, hi, Dr. Peter. This is Ash Bihari. Thank you for the amazing work that you're doing. My question is, the mastic cameras record large fish species caught as bycatch, which we imagine is only one aspect of understanding the natu natural patterns. What other data are needed to fully understand their life cycles and identify their hot hotspots? Thank you very much for the question. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Nick Belcher, and I am here on behalf of my amazing team at the Marine Research Foundation. Uh, while I play this sort of hidden role behind the scenes, they're the guys on the ground doing the real work. So to your question, look, in truth, to answer conservation questions, really you need to answer just three questions. How many animals are there? Where are they and what are the threats? Um, and, and the cameras that we're deploying, they already collect that sort of data. We know where animals are being caught. We know how many are being caught. And obviously, we know how they're being caught. And, and more in-depth studies like you know, knowing what these animals feed on or what their genetics are or how fast they grow, th those are all great, interesting things. But they're not going to save a species. Um, that said, the one thing that we can get from the from the cameras that adds to this to the quest to the solution is size, um, because when we find all of these small rays or small sharks, these point to reproductive grounds, 
and and that can highlight more important grounds than just anywhere else. Uh, okay, hi Nick, uh, Arifin here. Uh, could you please uh, share with us the uh, survival rate of the large fish uh, species caught on camera? And uh, are the fishermen uh, told to return them to, to the sea? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a really difficult and unfortunate question to, have to answer, um, but thank you. So in general, with the, with the vessels that we're working with, most of the species that end up on the deck are already dead. And, and this is a result of the prolonged tow times that trawls have. Uh, in, in Sabah, these trawlers are putting their nets down for three to five hours. Um, so a turtle, for instance, that breathes air is going to drown in that time that the net is underwater. And, and I've got to say that that's probably the most depressing aspect of this work. But the truth is that we're not here really to police the fishers. Um, we're, we're here to gather data that will help the Department of Fisheries implement effective conservation measures. And, and at the end of the day, these species were being landed anyway. Having said that, we, we do work with a number of really, really cool, responsible fishermen. We have a number of great photo series of seeing them pick up a, a sea turtle and carry it and put it back in the ocean. Um, so we're, I guess a lot of it comes with um, the trust that we've developed working with them over the years. Um, but also it, it comes from them being a little bit more aware about what some of those impacts are. Um, in, in the long run, the goal is not to stop fishing. The goal for us is to divert fishing around ecologically sensitive areas. And the data we collect will allow us to do just that. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Pilcher. Uh, Gary Tessera here. The third question, perhaps on a slightly different uh, theme, uh, we know your choice of, of using comic strips and uh, other types of media uh, to raise uh, awareness among the general public and the stakeholders. Would you be able to elaborate uh, on some of your plans to do this? Where, where would these strips appear? Thank you. Yeah, so, so just a little bit of background. A while back, I ran a great conservation project actually in Papua New Guinea. And we, divide, we devised this method to have a comic book for children and then a more sort of what I call an adult book for the grown-ups um, so that we could get this conservation message across. And I remember showing up in the village and all of the adults were sitting reading the comic book. <laughs> and it was, it, it was just this revelation that it, that it was such an easy... Uh, accessible way to communicate. And so we gave up on the adult book altogether. And I, and I think in Sabah, we have, we have the same opportunity. Um, over the last couple of years, we've worked with, with an absolutely outstanding local artist, uh, Lim Sheng Hao, who's developed some comic book uh, informatics for us, for our Turtle Excluded of device program. Mm -hmm. And and these are really cool, and, and I'd be happy to share them with the audience if, if you'd like to see, but, but, but the artwork is exceptional, but it makes it immediately relatable to fishermen. And, and it's something that, that you can grasp. You don't have to read some scientific document. So what we want to do with this project is expand on that, um, possibly with something like a, a periodic and regular comic strip that could go into both printed newspapers but also onto social media, something that would keep the story going over time, um, that would engage people over a lengthy period rather than it was a flash of information and then it died down. Um, and, and then finally, the last thing that I really want to do is, is see if through, through how and his contacts, we can actually build it up into a little bit of a contest amongst all of the talented local artists because we have some amazing talent um, lying around who, who need stories to tell. So I've got a story to tell and they have the medium to do it. I think bringing both of those together can be a great conservation, uh, a way forward for conservation. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Pilcher. Thanks, Dr. Nicholas and also the judges for that Q&A. 
we're going to go on to the final NGO that we have here today, uh, Reef Check Malaysia. This NGO operates in both Peninsula and East Malaysia, but the project submitted pertains to the East Coast Islands of Peninsula Malaysia. The project, Identifying Marine Ecosystem Connectivity Corridors on Peninsula Malaysia's East Coast. <laughs> Coral reefs are often called the rainforest of the sea because of their high biodiversity. Other than the richness in marine life that they contain, they also provide food and jobs to millions of people. They protect our coastlines from storms and their associated ecosystems such as seagrass beds are important carbon sinks, so they are hugely important in the fight against climate change. Imagine the impact if we were to lose those reefs. Food security for many would be reduced. Tourism related jobs would be lost. Those communities would be far worse off. And our vulnerability to climate change would increase. Fortunately, many coral reefs in Malaysia are protected in what we call marine parks. Here, many activities that damage reefs, throwing anchors, polluting and so on are forbidden, so reefs have some protection. So, all good, right? Well, not completely. It seems the protection might be incomplete. Supported by genetic studies, scientists have come to the conclusion that the various islands of the East Coast are connected biologically. Interestingly, the same studies also suggest that there must be reefs in between the islands acting as a kind of way station to help larvae on their journey north, enabling them to settle, grow, reproduce, and so new larvae continue on their way slowly northward, year after year. But here's the problem. The reefs outside the existing marine parks, the way station, they are not protected and therefore vulnerable to the wide range of impacts that can affect them. Fishing, mining, storm, climate change and so on. And if those reefs are damaged or even lost, then there are no way stations left and no connectivity between the islands. So here is what we are proposing. Working with relevant authorities and local academics, we are going to identify where these hidden reefs might be and go have a look at them. We will conduct surveys to assess the health and biodiversity of these reefs. We hope that we will be able to demonstrate where the connectivity corridors are that links the islands, which means we can protect them and help to preserve the health of reefs along the whole coastline. Reef Check Malaysia has been conducting surveys of coral reefs around Malaysia for 15 years. Our annual survey program, which covers over 200 sites, provides managers with essential data. We work with government agencies, local communities and volunteers to train divers and conduct surveys. From the survey program, data are available on the health of coral reefs around the islands. This project provides us with an opportunity to fill some important gaps, the way station. Help us to find these hidden reefs so we can complete the jigsaw puzzle of the ecosystem of the East Coast and make sure their biodiversity is protected for future generations. Thank you for that video and now we'll go on to the final Q&A session. Uh, hi, Shane here. Uh, with the first question. It's a very uh, interesting project with a very uh, wide scope. Uh, could you please uh, explain to us how do you Uh, I'm so sorry, Dr. Harifin, but we can't really hear you. Um, maybe maybe one of the other judges can ask the question if you have that in front of you, just so that our, um, our, our 
and Jill will be able to hear the question again. All right. Uh, can, I, can I read? Okay. The, the project appears very wide in scope. How would you measure the impact of your mapping project on biodiversity? Impact. <clears throat> um, okay, well, echoing what Nick and one or two other people have said, I wasn't on the video. I'm just a man behind the scenes as the general manager. Most of my guys, most of Reef Check staff are based out in the fields on the islands doing the very surveys we're talking about, as you can see in the picture behind me. Um, it might seem obvious to say that uh, in order to manage and conserve biodiversity, first you have to know where it is. Uh, what's there, what condition it's in, what threats it's facing, and how those threats can be mitigated. This just reflects what Dr. Nick was just saying about, uh, about knowing, knowing what we have. Um, but we often refer to coral reefs as the invisible ecosystem. Most people have never seen one. Uh, we've all seen a forest, just look out the window and we can see forests, whereas most of us uh, haven't seen reefs. So the problem at the moment is that we only know where some of our marine biodiversity is. So we can only manage that. Um, reefs around the islands off the east coast, for example, we know the way the reefs are there, but where is all of the other hidden marine biodiversity? So we have scientific evidence that there are hidden reefs. Um, so by confirming where they are, we can start to look for ways to protect them. Uh, now this achieves two things. First of all, it protects the actual biodiversity of the reefs themselves. Um, but secondly, it also helps to protect the connectivity that they, that they provide between known reefs, between the, the reefs in the south around Johor, uh, going up further north to the reefs around uh, 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 Tringanu, Printian and Redang. So that allows us to link all of these disparate parts together. We can look at managing large marine ecosystems. Yes, it's long-term, yes, it has wide scope, but the ocean is a dynamic, ever-moving system. So we have to look at it holistically. Uh, so that we can manage all of the component parts effectively. When we do that, we can have a much bigger impact on protecting biodiversity, which we can measure, to answer your question, uh, by healthy fish populations, because if the, bio, if the habitat is protected, then we'll get better fish populations. Uh, we'll have healthier coral reefs, so perhaps an improved uh, tourism product. So there are different ways we can measure the impact, but first we have to find out where they are and be able to protect them effectively. Uh, fine. My question, I think it's Hari. My question relates to coral bleaching, which is a consequence of global warming. Please tell us how your mapping of hidden reefs can help address this issue. Thanks. So, yes, coral bleaching is, uh, is an issue of increasing concern. Um, coral bleaching is a stress response by corals to an external stressor. Uh, that can be a localized stress, such as uh, siltation from land clearing. Uh, pick an island, chop down the trees, build a resort. Uh, it rains, like it sometimes does in Malaysia, and the silt gets washed into the ocean. And that can have a short-term stress uh, event on, on the coral reef. And then it's, it's washed away during, the, during subsequent tides. But yeah, one of the stresses that's growing in importance is, uh, is indeed warming oceans. Uh, and those can cause widespread bleaching. In fact, in back, going back to 1998, it was Asia, so it was around Southeast Asia, coral reefs around the whole region were, were bleaching. And it's happened several times in the last 20 years. In order to help coral reefs survive these periods of stress, we need to build the resilience of the coral reefs. A resilience is a quality of reefs and other ecosystems that describe how they're able to survive or recover from a stress event. The more resilient the reef, the more likely it is to survive and continue to provide ecosystem services. So think of this as a health issue. If the coral reefs are undisturbed, if they're in unpolluted water with no big impacts like fishing, overfishing, the reef will be healthy, it'll be, quite, it'll be calm and it'll be productive and it will be able to resist or recover from stress. It will be resilient. Now, we can do that around the islands, the reefs around the islands, the known reefs, because we can restrict tourism activities, we can manage construction on the islands, we can, we can train tourism guides and so on. So they can help to build resilience around the island reefs. But what about the hidden reefs? They're currently unprotected and they're facing any one of those threats that, I, I've just, that we've just been talking about. So if we can identify them where they are, they're where they are. We can kind of, we can bring them into the fold as it were. We can start to put protective measures in place, uh, establishing them as no take zones, for example, banning fishing. Uh, we can protect them from other physical impacts like, uh, like the physical impacts of trawling or from, or from boat anchoring. 
So in that way, we can start to build the, re the resilience of the reefs that are outside of the existing NPAs, these hidden reefs. Um, we can start to build their resilience and we can hope that they will then be in a healthier condition and better able to survive issues like uh, mass coral bleaching. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hyde, for your, for your answers. Uh, Gary Sarah here, a third question. Uh, these uh, hidden reefs, as you continue to map them, do you uh, intend to measure the water quality in these hidden reefs? Uh, and uh, is this data shared in any way with, with any of the other stakeholders? Thank you. Um, thanks, Gary. We, for the first cut, we will not be doing water quality testing. We, we've got too many other things to do. Uh, we've got a map to follow around. We've got to chase after finding these reefs. That is sufficient to get down there with a team of five or six people, do a mapping exercise, do a survey, start to collect biodiversity information. But see, not all of the reefs we find will be, will be healthy, will be useful, will be productive. So there's no point testing water quality everywhere. So what we will do is we will map where they are understand the genetics. We'll probably do genetic testing before we do water quality testing, because we need to know which of the way stations, as, as the video mentioned, where, is the, where are the larvae following, which path are they following? And then once we've identified those, that will be the time that we do water quality testing. Um, Marine Parks section of Department of Fisheries already does extensive water quality testing. Uh, mm -hmm. That is available. So, so there is some water quality data, but let's find the reefs first, and find out which are the important ones, and then we can do all of that other, other physical testing. Thank you, Ms. Hyde. Thank you, Julian and judges, for that. I think you all can agree that it's been such an insightful q &A session with all the six NGOs. So now while judges deliberate on a their very difficult decision, um, I'd like to invite Sunita back on the screen. Audience, you will now like you see a pop-up on your screen. So this is an audience poll um, just where a reminder, your vote will actually go to 10% um, of the overall score for the NGO judging. I'll give you all just one minute to ponder on your decision. And unfortunately, yes, you can only pick one NGO as your choice. I'm gonna put in my option right here. All right, Sunita, what are your thoughts so far on the session? Oh my goodness, this is such a difficult choice. I'm really glad I don't have to decide, but in my mind, every single one of them was a winner. Don't you think? No, I totally agree with you. And you know what? The proposal was super compelling. Um, and I wish I could support each and every angel, although only everyone did such a great job. Um, but you know what? The videos really told us such a, such, such a strong story on what they were trying to achieve. I love the videos too. And you know what? They were created by our interns who are university students across Malaysia. Thanks so much to Dr. Jarina of UMT who helped us to persuade them and award-winning director Rogue Irwan Junaidi who offered to mentor them. <laughs> I'm Well, we've actually prepared a short video to acknowledge and thank each one of these students who have stepped up to support biodiversity conservation. Great, let's start to play this into the slideshow then.
Thank you for putting together that the interview there. I think we all can agree as well. That was very hot and warming. <laughs> Where do you get that thread from? <laughs> Wanted to ask, I guess, how do you even? I mean, how was this home build award born? Um, and how do you manage to pick out these six angels <laughs> the money that you have over there? So, you know, um, last year we showcased the NGOs during Climate Week New York, and um, and I mean, that turned the spotlight on them, right? And we thought this year, in addition to spotlighting these great NGOs, why don't we see if we can also get some money for them? Because especially during the pandemic, so difficult to raise funds. And, you know, we just wanted to be able to support them even more. And uh, I think I can speak for everyone when we say we were just astounded by the quality of work that's being done. Yeah. No, for sure. And I can see, I mean, the hard work they put into this. And, you know, the quality of their, their, their answers as well. They were super prepared for, you know, the, the difficult questions that the judges drew that um. And also for our judges as well, actually, like how, how do you, you know, manage to, to pick them as well of the many ones I'm sure who were, you know, very keen to come onto this process as well. Yeah, I know. We were so thankful that the judges, uh, they were the first people we asked because they're so well known and, you know, highly regarded. And uh, they said yes. And so we were really thankful that we've got the judges that we have. But, um, you know, Megan, I think the uh, results are ready. Oh, are they? Yes. <laughs> all right, great. We can now actually invite all the NGOs and judges to turn on their cameras. And so, Denise, can I just invite you to announce the winner? Oh, there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm sure I speak for all of us who have been planning for the um, awards for so many months that we've received such a high quality of submissions. And the quality of the shortlisted six we heard today was also truly world-class. We really wish we could have supported every single one of you. And we have committed to promoting you as much as we can and introducing you to the corporate sponsors who are looking forward to meeting you. But for today, the judges needed to make a decision. So congratulations. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you in the next few months. Thank you. Thank you, Sunita, for announcing the award and congratulations to Bora. Uh, I, you know, I, it must be such a difficult decision for the judges. And, you know, Bora, I'm sure you all must be so pleased. I'm going to invite actually Bora back, um, you know, to just say a few words as the winner of the inaugural Home Bill Award 2021. Okay. Uh, well, well, that's a big honor. Um, I have to say, first of all, I feel slightly embarrassed because I, I agree with what everyone has said, including on the chat, that there isn't really any winner. And thanks Sun Sunita just now for that, that comment that it's all six of us will, will have some, some benefit coming out of this, this uh, competition. I mean, I personally, I do believe that the five other shortlisted applicants are equally outstanding. I think maybe Bora, to some extent, I mean, we chose elephants, that's, a bit, that's quite attractive. We're also in general, maybe in the right place at the right time and touched a chord uh, the, the sort of old style reactive, what I call reactive wildlife conservation measures that we see ought to be supplemented by more proactive and very focused uh, wildlife management interventions. Anyway, um, thanks to the judges and viewers and all supporters for granting this honor. I'd like to mention a bit about, I, I didn't mention earlier of the board, like, like the other, the three old white men here, we're in a, in a similar position. We have a a team and we're the public face. So I'd like to think to thank my all my Bora team for their great support. Most of them have been living in our jungle quarters with anything between two and 15 years now in Tabin Wildlife Reserve. Uh, Dr. Zainal has been there for 11 years and I'd say he's the, the brains and the details man on the ground, not only on elephants, on many other things we do. Um, I mentioned the departments in one of my, uh, uh, government departments in one of my comments earlier, uh, 
answer to questions. So I thank the wildlife and forest departments of Sabah again uh, for accepting our assistance and minimizing bureaucracy for us. Um, our colleagues in general in the Malaysian civil society organizations, NGOs, and partners amongst the progressive oil palm growers. So I think in summary, I'd say granting the Hornbill Award 2021 won't only provide Bora with better financial security in the coming year or so, uh, but also I hope, and more importantly, a platform to argue for further collaboration with businesses and financiers in endangered species management in Malaysia. So thanks again to you all. Thank you, Sean, for that, for that speech. And also, since we've got a little time, I'm going to invite Dr. Gary um, to say a few words on behalf of the judges. Thank you so very much, Megan. And first of all, and most importantly, a big a hearty congratulations to Bora on, on that, literally edging out uh, the, the competition here. Thank, uh, on behalf of my fellow judges too, uh, thanks to Climate Governance Malaysia uh, for allowing us to, to participate. We are honored and, and humbled by this experience. Um, my uh, distinguished fellow judges, uh, Prof. Muhammad Harifin and Mr. Rash Bahari, uh, this has been uh, one of the most difficult decisions we have had to make the proposals were all excellent and commendable uh, the initiatives by, by all these NGOs. And as been said repeatedly, they all deserve some kind of award. And we really wish we, we had the funding to, to provide to all of them. Uh, my fellow judges felt it's extremely inspiring to see the dedication that, that the participants put into saving our biodiversity. Uh, it really showed us that if we're going to have any hope of changing our current course, that we need to get everyone uh, to love and appreciate nature and to revel in this breathtaking beauty and variety. Uh, one day, may we all share the passion that the contest participants uh, have shown and felt for the well being of all species uh, with which we share this uh, planet. Uh, uh, my fellow judges and I were, were challenged by the diversity of the proposals, the quality the attention to, to detail and in the end we, we you know had simply to, to look for where we could find the highest impact to both the environment as well as, as the local communities and uh, we, are, we are hopeful that ultimately all of these proposals uh, can be matched with adequate and sustainable levels of funding and, and we wish them all the very very best and just as, as a, a, an additional note uh, a big note of appreciation to the background is particularly the, the video interns. It's, it's wonderful to, to see that we have such uh, amazing young talent in Malaysia. And uh, all we have to do is to provide them with the right kind of platform for them to show their metal. And that's all. Thank you so very much again, Megan. And once again, thanks to uh, CGM and all the supporting partners. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gary, for that. I think you ended on such a meaningful note. Um, you know, I think it takes everyone to, you know, to love and appreciate the environment for us to come to this stage and, you know, for all these wonderful NGOs to come to this stage as well. So now I'd like to invite the chairman of CGM to share our thoughts on about next year's Hornville Award. Thank you so much, Megan. I think many of us understand how critical biodiversity conservation is, that we maintain our civilizations and societies because the Earth's regulating ecosystems and biodiversity is simply put keeping us alive. But it is the NGOs, like the ones we have heard from today, who are the true frontliners, the eco-warriors, the boots on the ground, they are fighting the daily battles on behalf of every single one of us. They are the ones truly deserving of our support, whom we look up to and respect for their knowledge, their intelligence, the commitment, the dedication to such a crucial cause, their resilience in striving and continuing this essential service on our behalf against multiple challenges, especially during a pandemic. So CGM is certainly going to continue with plans for the Hornbill Award next year and hopefully bigger and better so that we can continue supporting these great leaders and patriots in our midst. On behalf of all of us behind the scenes, on behalf of our wonderful judges who have spent many of their valuable hours with us, 
On behalf of our corporate sponsors, Erica Capital, Astro, Better Malaysia Foundation, CIMB Foundation, Tenaga National, Yayasan Hasana, Yayasan Saim Davi, as well as leading media houses, Eco Business and IslamicMarkets.com, and PwC, who helped us with the assessment criteria and the shortlisting process. On behalf of all of these stakeholders, we want to thank all of the conservation NGOs who participated, especially the six who are shortlisted today. One Stop Borneo Wildlife, Bora, Club Alami, Marine Research Foundation, Reef Check, Reach. And most of all, we thank you, our audience, for supporting this recognition of conservation efforts in Malaysia. A huge congratulations to Bora, winner of the first Hornbill Award. We look forward to hearing more from all of you in the next few months. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for attending this Sunday or your day ahead.